thanks very much for coming tonight, everybody. My name is Jeffrey Anderson, and tonight we're going to be talking to you about running MySQL at scale, and specifically, actually scaling it up. Um, so just, just to get started, think of all the data you manage. Okay, knock out in your head. Now, maybe, you know, think of it in gigabytes, terabytes, maybe number of queries, maybe like 5,000 queries per second, maybe 50,000 queries per second. Now take that number that you come up with and double it. Okay? Double it again. Double it again. Double it. Okay, yeah, if you get the picture. So there's a lot of data that, and a lot of stuff happening. And this is actually what we had happen here at Box, and that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. So just a quick introduction. My name is Jeffrey Anderson. I'm a database administrator here. I work with MySQL and HBase. I also facilitate PD Hangouts, which is our bi-weekly Google Hangout. Uh, I welcome you to watch the live stream or participate. And the other speaker you'll see up here tonight is Richard Pond. He's a software engineer, he's over there, and uh, he works on our database tools and automation team. So just to kind of lay the groundwork of what we're talking about, we're gonna identify like what was the low-hanging fruit that we tapped at Fox first? What goals did we set to kind of get at all this stuff? How did we kind of beat the curve and stay ahead of the growth? And ultimately, what did we do to empower our developers? really take action and own a lot of the fixes that we wanted. Well, let me just tell you a little bit about where we are now. So we do about 20 billion queries a day, maybe more. Uh, we have about 50 terabytes of data in MySQL at the moment, uh, and over 15 billion files and file versions. And so just kind of thinking back to the beginning where we were talking about thinking about data growing twice, double, double, double. This was a problem that we had here at Box. Over the past two years, our in inbound request has grown 10x. And so, likewise, our data sets increased, the amount of infrastructure we've had to manage has gone up. And the key thing is we wanted to keep performance really good, even though all of this was happening. So some of the low-hanging fruit that we tackled to really keep ahead of this stuff, uh, the first big one was fixing the bad queries. And so things as simple as if there's a query that is kind of happening a lot and it's always getting the same data, just Throw that in cache, maybe. Uh, and the other big one is finding all those full table scans. Those are terrible. Get those out of your environment first thing. And the other big thing we did was focus on collapsing all of the queries into two common access patterns. The first one is selecting by primary key, uh, and the second is range scans by index. And doing that allows us to get a much more succinct and robust uh, request going through. So you're probably thinking, like, two access patterns, Jeff, what, wait, why? Well. How many of you have a query like this? Give me you know, a count of everything for a single, maybe, enterprise or something. You guys have to see this. Give me at least one. Someone's got something. There we go. Good. Uh, so this is really expensive. I mean, just this query is interrogating like 200,000 records to serve up one answer. And I mean, you can just imagine, like, file sort, temp table, this just sucks after a while. And ultimately, this is just a whole bunch of hidden work happening in your server. But you might be saying, like, Jeff, yeah, this is a relational database. That's what it's supposed to do. Are you telling me to use NoSQL, HBase, Cassandra, something like that? Well, let's, let's take a step back. You know, relational databases are really good at things like transactions and handling transactionality, durability, getting the data written, and you know, being able to persist it well. And ultimately, at its core, MySQL is a very good B-tree index, and that's something we can't forget. It's very good at doing this. So if we take a step back into the past real quick, just kind of looking at how Box grew. We started with a nice monolith, single database server, did all the work, and as usual, requests were coming in, hitting in, asking for data. And then one day while these requests were coming in, maybe the server just completely dies. So when this happened, we had to take the first set of actions. Let's find those bad queries and get some indexes on them. Let's start partitioning the data, breaking up the tables, moving them around a little bit. And any of those foreign keys that we have in the schema, they gotta go. They're, they are gonna kill us when it comes to locking. So then the next step was, okay, let's you know, start to break up the, the data set a little more, horizontally and you know, vertically shard it and get more nodes in. So maybe you have like an app cluster, maybe an authorization cluster, a couple of user shards are in there as well. And ultimately, replication becomes extremely important now. You wanna make sure you've got you know, HA, DR, uh, you don't want replication to get impacted too much when you're serving read traffic off of read-only replica, maybe. And those requests are still coming in at a pretty high velocity, so you've got to keep up with that and keep your throughput good. So 
when you're here, this is when you start to look at, you know, we're going to denormalize more of the data. So that earlier example, instead of doing a count star on enterprise ID, let's just denormalize that as a field on the enterprise record. So you can just look it up on the enterprise record. It saves yourself a lot of time. Start aggressively optimizing all of these bad queries that you know in your environment. And maybe it's time for a nice hardware refresh, get a faster processor, and be able to do this stuff a lot better. And what was interesting here, for Box at least, this is also about the time we learned about uh, thundering curves. Um, internal DDoSs are very painful and happen a lot. And again, that locking and concurrency stuff started to kind of crank up at this point. So then you go to the next phase. You've got this kind of partitioned environment, things are moving, and then you really start to scale it out and get a whole bunch more. And those requests are still piling in lots and lots of all the time. So now we start to think every clock cycle counts. If we can shave a millisecond off of one query, that can save us probably minutes or hours of aggregate time that users are spending in our system. Outliers are really, really out by now. In Box, a typical customer might have a couple thousand files in their account. Some enterprises, though, might have 10 million or hundreds of millions of files. And these edge cases will really degrade your system if you're not ahead of the curve. And this is also when you learn that how crappy and terrible unbounded results sets are. If you have someone that's trying to get 100 million records in one fell swoop, it slows you down. And ultimately, you get into this even worse locking problem. This is what the database server looks like when you're locking hundreds of thousands of records in it over and over. I mean, just imagine trying to ride this bike. It, it's not going anywhere. So what can we do to just kind of stay ahead of the curve here? Well, there's two things DBAs fundamentally want. The first is stability, and the second is predictability. But how do we get at these two kind of things? And the answer is, well, let's start by simplifying the access patterns. If you have 500 unique types of queries going through your system, can you collapse some of them down and you find situations where you don't need to have like that extra clause for this one request? Start finding ways to bring that down. And the other one is you want to eliminate all that wasted work. So let's talk about, let's just kind of real quick review some indexes to see what I'm talking about here. Say you have a query, you're doing a lookup on a secondary index. And so MySQL is pretty good at these for the most part. You'll have your secondary index, you'll do a rank scan down over it, and that'll get you the data for the secondary index. Uh, it'll also get you a pointer to your primary key, and then you can do point selects on your clustered index in MySQL to get it all the data. And fundamentally, remembering that a table in MySQL is just a cluster. So all the data is right off the primary key, primary key order. But what if you really want that sorting? What if you want to throw that order by at the end on a non-index value? Well, this gets a lot uglier now, because you're still doing that secondary index scan, but then you have to copy this data to a temp table. Then you have to sort it and ultimately bring your results set together. And that's when you have this data sorted on this non-index value. And this is just a lot of wasted work in your system. And realistically, I mean, can this be solved by maybe just adding another index or maybe doing the sorting up in your application? So I just want to reiterate, eliminate the wasted work, find it and get rid of it, crush file sort. So at this time, uh, I'm going to change gears a little bit and start talking about developer empowerment. And one of the key things with this is, as DBAs, we want to make sure the tools are in place so that our developers can get at the data they need to help them with things. Hi everybody, my name is Richard Pond, and I'm going to talk to you about a project that I've been working on that empowers developers, but additionally helps protect our database layer. We call this the technical queries in depth, and it's very descriptive. What we want to do is, in our dev environment, can we detect and identify queries that are slow and prevent them from getting into production? So one of the goals like I just mentioned, is to protect our production environment. We want to enable a shorter feedback loop to developers. And thirdly, we want to make a seamless development experience for developers. We don't want developers to have to jump through hoops, write additional tests, do anything extra in order for this to be effective. So now let me tell you how it works and what our approach is. So there's a lot of stuff here, but it's actually pretty simple. First, we're going to start with the developer. We write some code. We're going to run some PHP unit tests. We run it on a box cluster runner, which is an open source project that allows us to run all of our tests in parallel. 
we run these tests with our slow log enabled. And we set the parameters so we can log every single query that our integration tests perform. We then analyze these queries with Perkona's PT Query Digest, so open source tool. And then we use Box Anonymometer to find out, hey, are any of these queries bad? It gives us a pretty good estimate of what queries look bad, but then we actually have to go to an additional step and we run the explaining plan on each of those queries. We have a simple criteria. Hey, is this a file sort? If so, it's bad. We'll post results back to a code review, back to the developer. Very, very simple. Developers can get results back very quickly, and it's simple. So where are we now? So we validated this approach. We have results back that shows that this approach can, in fact, identify queries that we don't want in production, and now we can go back and clean those up. We're currently tuning the system, making sure that our detection rate is high enough to detect the bad queries that we want to. And we're currently running this silently. We're testing this at scale to see if we can run this on every single commit that goes through our system. And so that pretty much sums up the current project that I'm working on right now. And I'm going to hand this back to Jeff. Okay. Cool. So let me just work on wrapping this up then. Uh, so the last thing I want to tell you guys about is quantifying and prioritizing. And so this is extremely valuable because, you know, maybe you have bad queries in your system. What you want to do is find those bad queries. Maybe there's certain queries that happen a lot more often than others. So you want to be able to say, hey, if this happens 100 times, we should probably focus on optimizing this before the one query that only happens once. But the other thing you can do is maybe assign a, on a scale of 1 to 3, how bad it is. If it's a 3, it's really bad. You use that to help prioritize the work. And so we've done this here at Fox, and we've got our developers to come and support us and really focus on kind of hammering these things down and making them better. Um, the other thing is looking for low value features. So I mean, everyone's probably seen something like this, pagination to page like 20 something on some website. Very few people actually do this, right? And so engage your product people, figure out, you know, if, if are less than 5% of users going to page 27? If they are, let's get rid of this. This is just a wasted query on the database. And that brings us to the last one, which is finding these unnecessary queries in your system. If you have a select count star that's always running right before you end up querying for the data anyways, it's kind of wasteful. Maybe you can just pull that out and save yourself like half of your QPS and a whole bunch of time to connect towards the count tables. So just wrapping up on this then, the growth is going to happen. And maybe for you where you are today, you're kind of down in this area, you know, 50,000, Five, or yeah, 50,000 QPS kind of working through it. You really want to be planning, like think ahead, be ready for where your things are going to be in two years, six months, however fast the growth may happen. And then the big one is, while you're doing this, you can focus on eliminating the hard work, or the hidden work, sorry, powering your developers to take action and own the, the solutions. Demand stability and predictability of your infrastructure and the access to it. And quantify and prioritize any of the work that's coming through. So, I'm actually curious what works for everyone else here. If you've done any of these things already, feel free to tweet at us and let us know. If you haven't, we'd love to hear how some of these solutions work out for you. And we'd also encourage you to check out our technical blog for any of the information that we talk about here today. And with that, I think we're all set. So we'll take any database questions while Jenny gets set up. So we predominantly run InnoDB here. I don't, I don't think we run any other storage engines, right? Not really. I mean, we had my ISAM before, and we crushed that out because of bad things. Um, but yeah, I, I know things like TokuDB, you know, uh, Perkona's partnering with them a lot more. Actually, Perkona acquired them. So you can get TokuDB now built into Perkona server, and that's definitely something that might be on the roadmap in the future. Yes? 
It used to be rule-based optimization, then it was cost-based. Just wondering where it's at now. And also the NoSQL-like functionalities, the my structured data support Oracle did that a few years ago. I mean, is that working out, or was it just pipe smoking here? Um, so with respect to the first question, I'm sorry? Still yeah, it's still cost-based. I, like, I, I don't think it ever did rule-based. That, that sounds like an Oracle, Oracle server thing from a couple of years back, yeah. Um, and the second for the... Uh, yeah, so to, to repeat what Gavin said, 5.6 is exposing a lot more of this performance information and making it more valuable. And with respect to the NoSQL stuff, um, I mean, currently here at Box, we run HBase in addition to MySQL. Uh, and Facebook had a great presentation about Polyglot uh, data stores and running multiple things. So um, there are different interfaces into MySQL that can skip the optimizer, like the Memcache interface and Handler Socket. And those are definitely things that are worth evaluating. I know we've looked at Handler Socket and seen some very promising results. Uh, the questions? Okay, thank you very much, guys. All right, so next up is Jenny uh, with you. Uh, so I'm cracking up at the title of this um, talk with a friend of mine named Joe was buying a book in Berkeley, and um, it's called Doodles Every Day, and it's clerk, and it's picking out some Doodles every day. Um, I kind of like the same question here because we should be doing schema changes every day. Um, otherwise, they're one-offs and dangerous processes, and uh, we can become really scale. My name is Jenny Snyder. Um, I'm a MySQL DBA at Yelp. Um, I've been doing MySQL DBA work for about 12 years now. Um, I was the first MySQL DBA at Yelp, and I've been here for four years. Um, I also have co-founded and co lead um, Awesome Women in Engineering, an internal resource group, and also Yelp Moms. Um, one of my passions is diversity in engineering, so if that's something you're interested in talking about later, just uh, let me know. Um, like all the organizations here, we're hiring, so uh, there'll be a link to our blog and our Twitter at the end. Um, if you don't know about Yelp, um, Soundbite is. Yelp is a website, a mobile app that connects people with great local businesses. Um, we were founded in 2004 and it's been evolving ever since. And it's more than just reviews. And I say that because I don't want you to think that we're one of those architectures where we simplify down to five tables, um, made it really simple. But um, instead, this is a this is a problem we all face. Our complex architecture is complicated, and um, what works for us will absolutely work for you. Um, we have many logical and functional vertical shards. Hundreds of database tables are on hundreds of database servers. Our servers are both in physical data centers um, on the east and west coast of the United States. We also have multiple um, you know, virtual data centers in EWS, both in the United States and Europe. Um, I would say that the majority of those hundreds of tables are pretty small, under 10 gigabytes, but um, some of our most critical tables are significantly larger, um, some of which are like in the 50, 80 gigabyte range. So again, this isn't just the like tiny little weird one-off um, situation. And um, we don't have any horizontal sharding yet. Um, so you can change this every day. Um, you must change your schema. Um, you have to make it a safe, repeatable process that anyone can do any time. And in order to do this, you have to use or write your own So let's get to work and figure this out. Um, you have to make schema changes or die. It's just a measure. Your application must evolve. Um, if Yelp looked the same way it did as it did back in 2004, no one would be using it. It would be um, pretty functionless, and other companies that iterate will move faster than you, make more progress, be more popular. Um, so there's new features, and bugs happen. Um, they've got to be fixed. Sometimes some pretty radical structural changes, and um, no one gets it right the first time. If you have done so, let me know. If you're hiring. <laughs> but um, it's just it's just not it's not possible. I know it's not. Um, and you can't try and solve this problem by adding database tables. Um, I know this for a fact because we tried to do it and we came up with something that I coined the Weasley schema. Um, so in the Harry Potter books, every time the Weasley 
had another child, they would kind of like plop a room onto their house. And you know, this is very top heavy. Um, if you have a big table and you create a new table that contains options or features to it, um, you can backfill that table. So you've got a 10 gigabyte table and it's 12 gigabyte options. You don't want to alter that, alter that table, so you can create another one. And you end up with huge numbers of joins, um, complicated schmutz being generated by your ORM layer. And um, your code looks funky as a result, and it's just not worth it. So instead, don't let your schema or your database hold back developer productivity. Um, you want to be able to experiment. You know, Don't spend weeks designing a schema, because that's the only chance you get. Instead, try something, and if it doesn't work, alter the table. Um, refactoring is a good thing, and if you, your database doesn't let you do that, then you'll really be preventing yourself from making good, amazing, fast things happen. Uh, so this sounds sketchy, I totally get it, but um, again, it's make it a regular, safe process. I'll be talking about the things that worked really well for me during this talk. Chances are, or hopefully, you'll be able to find something in here that resonates with you that you can pick up and make sense to you as well. Um, this involves lots a little baby step. Um, we have, our schema changes are decoupled from our code, meaning that we, if we're going to be implementing a new feature, we're going to be adding a new column, we make our schema changes first. Um, then later, once the databases are all up to date, it's only then that we push our code. Um, we also no longer do any um, bulk PML, so if we alter, if we alter a table, we add a new column, we do that back population and we populate that data using our business logic in our code, you know, much like I'm sure your application does. We have lots of really neat stuff in our code. We know how to modelize the database and handle replication in a way. Um, that's the only place where our business logic lies. If we don't duplicate code anywhere, hopefully you're not doing that either. Um, and it just really simplifies things because it also empowers the developer to make these changes as opposed to having a DBA be responsible for stuff that really isn't um, safe schema changes, but by that our definition is that you know, we have a series of rules for what our schema changes look like, and this means that we don't allow any columns with non null constraints, where we don't have a default value. Um, we don't drop or rename anything in an atomic um, way, and we don't do any destructive database change, data changes in type or length. You know, we don't make columns shorter, but you can't make them longer. Um, and if you're going to do something where you're altering a table to create, um, you know, make it a different type of, say, a superset, say, converting an integer to a bar char because you know that an integer is a subset of the bar char of characters, you can do this, but you really need to make sure that you're not using that column for a join anywhere because that's the fastest way to move yourself to table scan and build. Um, something that I thought of when um, Jeff was giving his talk that I forgot to mention on my slide, so we don't use foreign keys either. Um, I really don't know very many people who do, so that's one caveat that you have to think of. Um, if it's worth a performance penalty for you to implement foreign keys, you should do that, and this will work, but it just requires a little bit of extra thought. The DBA's role in this process is, so we're a team of three at Yelp, my SQL DBAs. Um, our job is to advise and help developers make the decisions that they need, but we don't make them for developers. We're available on our IRC and there's always this concept of one DBA who's on point. Um, one DBA runs interference with the other two by being the person whose name is in the topic of the channel. Right now I have to be on point and on call. Do not have my phone near me, which is probably a bummer. Um, we also make ourselves available in something called DBA office hours, which I think we actually pick up from a box DBA. Um, we make ourselves available a couple hours a week just hang out in our room. So anyone with any DBA question on top of this at any time. And uh, other than that, we're in meetings or towns every day, day, grab us at any time. The second way that we help is we're automatically added to every code review that involves a schema change. So the on-point DBA is always going to be there taking those reviews and trying to get really fast turnarounds. So again, we're not holding any of them We also have push masters. Um, these are special members of our engineering organization who have been trained in pushing our code. And ultimately, at the end of the day, Push masters who are the ones who are pushing our code to production, and they're also responsible for pushing our schema changes to production. Um, they have tools, they have documentation, and they have checklists. 
Um, Jeff, I love that you also use Johnny Five in your slide. Hopefully, um, Facebook has also got them on Pinterest too. But so we also use computers. You know, it's, we work with them. Why are we doing all this work manually? So we have tools during development, on our way to production, and after the fact. During development, we also have a heavy suite of unit tests um, that our developers can run, and part of those unit tests are the gross query checker. Um, gross query checker is a set of code that when running in their dev or in our build bot in the environment, um, every query that we run, we run explain on it first, determine whether that query plan indicates that it's going to perform poorly, we raise an exception right then and there, stop the test right in its tracks. Developers can't whitelist queries, but there's actually a pretty intense Google process for that. Um, we also use Review Board for our code reviews. It's pretty standard, and there's an automation and review board too that we can use to ensure that DBAs are always involved in push plans for sorry, push plans for schema change management early and often. Um, and then some automation as we go to prod. Um, push Manager is an application that we've open sourced. You can find it in our GitHub repo, and it's a way for developers to make requests so that push Push masters can say, I see that you've made this request, I'm going to pick it up, I'm going to perform it in an atomic fashion. Um, we have a nice little tidbit where review board and push manager talk to each other, so that as soon as something has all the shipments, the developer says go, a request appears in push manager. We also do a lot of our coordination in IRC, and we use QBot very frequently to let us know what's going on at any given point in time. When it's time to make the actual schema change, we use PT online schema part of the open source component toolkit module, um, along with PC Query Digest that Box is using. Um, the web algorithm is that it creates a new table identical to your original. It runs your alter against that new table and then uses a series of triggers to capture changes being made online to your, to your, to your, to your table as it's coming in while simultaneously backfilling it in chunks. Um, there's a couple of different noteworthy arguments that we use. Uh, no drop old table means we're going to keep the old table around. Um, we've only needed to use it once, and this was actually my fault last week. So glad we had it around, but usually you can just drop it pretty quickly. Um, we also use the recursion method to keep, to keep the spot of replication, knowing how replication is behaving in the system lets PT online schema change know when it's time to slow down or when it can actually speed up. Um, when running an online schema change, we restrict PT online schema change to peak lag underneath six seconds. Um, we denote critical load by, I think, critical, by the number of threads running being something like 200 on our master database server. And you can run it with dry run, which is kind of a test when you start off. Um, there's some awesome things about PT online schema change, and that is that it's incredibly customizable. It monitors replication play for you. It monitors load. And your changes are propagated through replication, which just ties in really nicely to our disaster recovery system. Um, things that suck about PT online schema change, but it's in Perl, but I'm not going to trip about that. What I really do care about is that it uses triggers, um, which means that if you already have triggers on insert update speed on a table you want to alter, you're going to have to find another, another tool. And also, when you're adding and dropping triggers from a database, if you need something called the table metadata block. This means that if you have a long-running query or a long-running transaction against your table, you're going to have to sort those out before you move forward. Um, Jeff might be laughing because I actually found out about this with him, and um, I think this might actually be a direct quote from his blog post about it, where I set spot wait time out to five and avoid pileups in the database. If PC online speed to change sounds sketchy to you, if you're not into it, that's totally cool. There's other options. Um, Etsy has a master master replication setup where they take half their databases databases offline and form the altar there and then flip the front. Um, their wiki, sorry, their blog is called Code is Draft. Um, this is another good way to optimize like look into this. But regardless, once you're in production, you need to see what's going on with your system. So I just made a change. Was it a great idea? Or do I need to call people? Um, we do a ton of monitoring. Uh, we love Sensu. Um, we're kind of off the Nagios train that makes me really happy. Um, we easily monitor 40 aspects of every database in production. So we know as soon as something seems to be up. Um, we also have a great visualization tool for our application error logs. So push masters can know, hey, I just did something that might seem wrong. 
Um, we also have the query killer, so if queries are running slowly, we can nip them in the bud while we figure out what's going to happen. Query killing also seems very scary to some people, but if you have queries that are taking longer than 60 seconds, chances are no one's waiting for those results anyway. So kill it, capture the error, record it for posterity, and move on. Um, I think the thing that we're going to be doing differently as we move forward is eventually all of our schema changes are going to be made by the UC online schema change and maybe even someday by robots. Um, right now we're investigating um, using PT Online's schema change invoked by a Jenkins job. We're not doing continuous deployment, but that doesn't mean that we don't love Jenkins for the jobs that it can queue up and the automation can provide to us. Um, we're also looking at seeing whether Liquibase is the right tool for us. Um, again, we want more automated IRC notifications because we're pretty addicted to them. And um, my personal wish list is that someday we'll have graph annotations to automatically pop up. Right now, we are to use these heavily for when a config change goes out and when a push happens. I would love to see one of the schema changes be so natural that no one has to think about it. Um, closing thoughts. Um, work with your developers. You know, especially if you're the only DBA or one of two DBAs in a large engineering organization. Work with your developers to help build these tools that will ultimately be empowering them and keeping DBAs out of the bottleneck of this process. Um, separate your schema changes your code. Um, push both PML, those insert updates and things, into the code itself, give your developers back the power, and um, ask for help. Nobody's good at everything, and um, that's why I'm glad that I'm empowering developers, that I'm not doing this all the time. I could do steam machines all day, but um, that's not as exciting to me as this. Um, last thoughts, uh, JC Superstar on Twitter. Um, you can follow Yelp Engineering on Twitter. You can check out engineering blog.yelp.com and we also have a really robust repo on Git, I'm sorry, on Git that I really recommend for tools like Push Manager, the um, public like so thanks. Yeah, does anyone have any questions for Jenny before uh well, I will say, Tom, I really like the idea of the query filler, filling queries after a certain. Oh, if, oh, I really like the idea of the query killer for web for user facing databases. Yeah, uh, that's a Percona toolkit tool as well. It's called PT Kill, and um, I'll be blogging about it in a couple of weeks. Anyone else? Yep. Uh, yes. Okay, for the people who were old enough to remember this database joke. The definition of third normal form is the key, the whole key, and nothing but the key, so help me cod. If you don't know what that means, ask your TBA. Sorry, that was lame. Thanks. Um, you had a question? The blue and white shirt and glasses? Okay, so um, I love your idea about go ahead and make it but then uh, you also say you never do or try to avoid destructive changes. Yep. That's the recipe for a really, really big schema. Sure. So um, maybe I should have been a little more clear. So we do our schema changes in steps. So if I was to, say, um, remove a column from the database, we do this all the time. I, I do not advocate data hoarding um, in our databases. So if we're going to do something destructive, like drop a column, we would, first put, we would first push a code change to remove all of the code that accesses that column first. Then we would slowly go and unpopulate that column with one of those batch jobs to ensure there's no data in it, and then we would drop it from our database. So we get so we do do destructive database changes all the time. We just do them in a separate way from the code. Okay, uh, the, I guess the, the issue I have, especially in this, in this in the tech bubble, where you have a lot of churn, a lot of people come and say, oh, we need a table to do this, oh, we need a table to do that. And, it, and then someone else, like your DBA, says, you know, you have five tables that are doing the exact same thing. We really need to drop four of them and just use one of them. Which is, I guess, a little bit similar in that you make sure you're not using four of them. Actually, I kind of empower the developers do that. I don't, I don't grandma over the schema. In fact, I could probably I probably couldn't tell you what half the tables in our databases do. I look at the problem once to optimize, and um, we make sure that we are providing enough hardware and enough services so that that isn't a big deal. I think that our I 
I trust that our developers are doing the right thing and trying to optimize their code so they're not you know, storing the data more times than they need to. Thanks. that uh, after all the talks, we're going to bring all the speakers back up for any other questions, whether general or specific to the talks. So uh, with that, we'll uh, move on to Nathan and Facebook.
So the problem that we had a small team that's really watching this like these guys would normally find out about problems before anyone else because they're watching web errors, they're watching uh, people in the ops channel screaming. <laughs> they, uh, we need a way to basically not rely on SRO to tell us that the world was on fire. Um, given my experience working with the replica monitoring agent, I was pretty confident that we could solve that problem. Um, Another problem is that our customers wanted to have support for a high availability of SQL. And with Nagios taking so long to even notice that the servers are down, there's no way we could offer that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how, how we fixed it. The first thing you need to know is that at Facebook, we have a huge number of MySQL instances. Uh, as such, they're, they're shorted heavily. Um, the basic data structure you need to understand is a MySQL replica set. We have this parent tier, which contains all the replica sets at, my, at Facebook. Um, one individual replica set has a number of services, which are typically distributed across the regions. Um, it's either master, slave, slave. In addition to that, we've got shards there. So those are all the, the schemas or databases that, that those machines are actually responsible for servicing. So in this example, the server, there's two instances on it. These little gray boxes are bases or shards. Um, got two replicas. Master here, slave here. This whole thing is called a replica set. This is really useful when you're thinking about a, uh, how to monitor this. If we can put an agent on all these machines, then it's really trivial to communicate with all of them and do some fancy stuff. So. So we run this monitoring agent, we call it DB status. It runs on every service on the, on the replica set. Um, in order to avoid adding additional services to our configuration management system, well, it basically just runs on MySQL server, server port plus a fixed offset. So essentially there's a thread on this, this agent that is constantly inserting a heartbeat into the master server. If that heartbeat, for whatever reason, fails, then the agent will initiate a move. So, important threads in the agent are the heartbeat thread. Like I said, that inserts into the, the master regular intervals to determine lag. It does some other useful things like publish uh, lag data to memcache so that we can use that in our asynchronous deletion framework. It allows people to back off their delete queries when they're slamming the replica. Um, Replica set status task, that's basically responsible for going out and running show slave status on every member of the replica set. Uh, and then we have the master health check task, which when, when, detect, when it detects that the heartbeat fails, it will initiate the vote based on all this data that the other threats have collected to determine if the service is really done. Uh, so I mentioned voting. These are our voters. Uh, basically, we have a list of IO threat errors that indicate to us that there is a problem connected master database. That for each member of the replica set that's considered one vote. If the replica is down for whatever reason, then we can always, because this is a, a thrift monitoring agent, we can always query the, the, the agent via thrift and just say, hey, were you able to insert uh, into the heartbeat table? Uh, even if my signal wasn't down. So we can still continue. Uh, there's also another a third voter that uh, is important for the fast failover. It only exists in the case of fast uh, These bin log tailors, they also run a thrift service. Um, and if and we can query those to see what they think the status of the master database is as well. Um, so the voting is pretty basic here. I mean it's, it's a basic form of voting, n divided by two plus one. If we have a majority rule that the server is down, then it's down. Uh, we need to raise an alert, we need an SNOS, uh, we need to initiate a promotion. Basically, so this slide says the future, but in reality, we're actually already using fast failover on a number of production tiers. This has been proven to work. We're happy with it, and the future is really trying to roll this out to the rest of our fleet. So, in the new world, we have these same replica set, uh, but we've added a few additional services. We've got these tailor servers both in the master and the fallback region. Uh, what they're responsible for is basically providing semi-sync acknowledgements 
uh, to the master server so that we can guarantee that bin logs have been written in more than one location uh, before returning a successful result back to the client. So fast failover, some of the most important bits of this are the tailors. MySQL bin log is running in semi-sync mode. That basically allows us to do uh, a big number of instances stacked on one host. So you might have noticed that the port numbers were weirder on the tailors, and that's because there's a wide range of ports that can be used because it's something like 40 to 80 tailors per, per instance. These are just basic database servers. Um, GCIDs are pretty important. They allow us to do uh, safer and easier failovers. Uh, essentially, when we when we initiate a promotion, we'll have to pick a uh, pick a replica that, that's uh, the, the candidate for a promotion. And once we do that, we can take the transaction from the long tailor, replay them onto the, the new master, and then essentially just point all the, replica, the other the remaining replicas at that new master and set them to auto position catch up to the same position in the demo stream. Uh, semi sync I mentioned earlier, make sure that our data is replicated and we can actually get this data into the new master. Um, another important thing is like when you think that a master is down, you're probably right, but maybe not. So how, how do we prevent, <laughs> how do we prevent uh, split brains where, where there are two masters accepting write connections? Uh, Semi-sync is great for this because in this instance, if we set an infinite, time, infinite timeout, uh, essentially we can kill all rights to that master simply by killing off the semi-sync tailors. Uh, so that's a great feature. <laughs> so that's pretty much all I have to say about monitoring on Facebook. So uh, here's my contact information. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, DB status is based off of an internal product, but uh, if you do have interest in writing an agent like this, we do have a version of the Python Thrift service that is open source. Peter uh, Rupal wrote it and published it. So theoretically, you could create this on your own. Um, Questions for Nathan before he uh, takes off? I didn't quite catch the part about semi sync. Um, I was wondering if you could give a quick rundown as to the semi sync service that you were talking about. Yeah, so it's pretty simple. I mean, uh, so, so basically, there's these Taylor servers. They run multiple instances of MySQL. MySQL bin log is running in, in a mode that it provides semi-sync acknowledgements back to the master. Um, and then these tailors actually live in the data center, inside the, in the region, outside of the rack uh, of the, the master, right? So these are supposed to be the fastest uh, replica, essentially. They're always, they should always have the latest transaction in the master. That would allow us to basically do the fast failover without losing data. That was the main of uh, one thing to note about this was that we did have to port losses in this thing back from 5.7 uh, because essentially 5.6 was committing to the NODB transaction log before writing the log. So that was, it was not crash safe. So you might have to use 5.7 or the web scale SQL uh, build. But sort of not kept up completely, but I do know that Facebook has things like Hive and Pig and Hip Hop VM, a phenomenal assortment of things. How does MySQL fit into that whole ecosystem? So I mean, we have a lot of, uh, we have a ton of uh, software in our toolbox, right? And all these different services, they provide different uh, good performance for different use cases. Uh, Harrison Fisk did a good talk about this called Polyglot Performance at Facebook. Uh, it was a Percona talk. I think it's, it's uh, out there for you to watch if you're interested. Uh, but basically, MySQL is the backbone. Like everything, that you're, everything that you're doing on the site, likes, photo sharing, all that kind of stuff is on MySQL. 
Uh, we also have internal tooling uh, for uh, that, that you might see. Well, we have self-service self instance provisioning for, for people who are working on internal tools or tools that may only need a single database. Uh, so there's lots and lots and lots of MySQL going on, and I don't have time to keep up with what the rest of them are doing. Thanks. Thank you. So the final talk is with Ron from Pinterest, and then after that we'll have a Q&A with uh, everybody. Howdy everyone. My name is Rob Wolch. I work at Pinterest on the cloud team, um, and this is Lifecycle for MySQL Server. You may have at some point read the Facebook posts on MPS and state machines. Um, I'm lazy and dumb, and I like workflows, uh, and this is how uh, things work at Pinterest. Uh, so some prehistory. I started as uh, Pinterest's first MySQL DBA a year and a half ago. Um, before that, nobody really had ownership of it. Uh, various people tried to work on it at times. Um, they made some really good decisions, in my opinion, early on, uh, in particular using Zookeeper uh, for service discovery. I don't actually love Zookeeper at all, but having a single uh, method for doing service discovery enables all sorts of automation. Um, the other automation that existed uh, had some problems, and, let's see. and uh, things got better. So what does MySQL do for Pinterest? Um, you guys have all probably ended up at, at, on Pinterest at one time or another searching for recipes or, I don't know, the latest bags from Prada, whatever. Um, and uh, Pinterest is sort of a visual bookmarking service. Uh, so people have boards, and inside uh, the boards they have pins with uh, images and some uh, data that goes with it. An example would be recipes having what ingredients and steps uh, and a photo. Most of the stuff gets stored in MySQL. An awful lot of it actually gets stored in MySQL. Uh, that's not all. Uh, async job queues and uh, a lot of our monetization stuff is going into it. That's not to say that MySQL is alone. Um, we have an awful lot of HBase, we have some Redis, but you get the idea. Um, so a little bit of additional prehistory in here. Uh, so, there were, let's say that a database server died right after I started. Um, if it was master, the failover would probably take five to ten minutes to run. Um, and then launching a server would take several minutes while I went into a console to figure out what exactly it had been, made sure not to reuse a host name that existed. Um, and then sometimes the workflow would have problems. And it would not be uncommon for me to have to check in every two hours several times in order to get to a complete build. So it was pretty laborious. Um, there were other issues, uh, performance. Um, other folks mentioned schema change before I started. It had been a very, very long time since they had felt empowered to do any schema change, which was not good. Um, but what I'm going to focus on mostly in this presentation is um, the life cycle of MySQL server. And it fits into six distinct buckets. Now, uh, the creation of a, a new replica is the only step that uh, requires a human intervention, and uh, everything else uh, just happens. And the first step doesn't actually need to have human intervention. You just haven't done the plumbing in order to have it automatically happen. Uh, there's a script which takes one argument that's required, the old host name, the server that needs to be replaced, and sometimes there is only one argument. You know, a server dies, give me a new one. Uh, so this works. That said, an awful lot of the time, we use this for building up uh, new server um, uh, on new hardware or new servers on new versions of MySQL, that sort of thing. Moving uh, around security groups, moving around uh, availability centers. Uh, this is our one-stop shop. It only works on replicas because masters require another step 
and we haven't done the glue for that yet. Um, but at this point, a failover is one command with one argument, and it just works. So you run this command, and it writes one row to my SQL uh, log, and it calls uh, a cloud API, which launches a box. And that's all. That's it. The box comes up, hopefully, um, and then Puppet runs, and then Puppet runs, Puppet runs some more. Sooner or later, uh, Puppet uh, converges to uh, a stage where all the mounts have been mounted, all the packages have been installed, and it creates a cron job. And the cron job is very simple. If there is nothing in the MySQL data directory, do the next thing. And this is pretty much how everything in this process works. Do some stuff, and then hand off. And it naturally flows. And the next thing is restoring a backup. And this process is called by other things other than the build script, or the, other than the cron job. But uh, the general use case is being called by the cron job. That said, it has a bunch of safety features. Uh, the biggest one is make sure this thing is not in the zookeeper. Uh, if it's not in the zookeeper, it's, we can destroy it. Um, and if it is, not so much. So it pulls down a backup, an XP stream, uh, which is a binary backup of NOD. It restores it, uh, starts up MySQL, uh, sets up replication, waits for replication to get caught up, adds uh, the new replica to a ZK, and then it runs backup. So that if we need to build another one, uh, this can be the target for uh, the new replica. We don't have GTIDs, so uh, we're more tied to where a backup is from, and we have less flexibility. Someday we'll probably uh, set it up, but it doesn't hurt us particularly badly. So once the ZK entry has been created. The server is now in production, and that means alarms come on, cron jobs are gated on it, like backups. If server is replica, run backup, that sort of thing. Um, we run PT checksum nightly on a subset of our data. Fun fact: it's something like one in five hundred million rows uh, differs, and it's mostly scrolled like characters. I assume that some weird bug in my SQL. Anyways, uh, these things now serve traffic. Awesome. Um, and they will serve traffic, or not, for a long time. Or maybe not. Um, and then someday, this uh, process will happen again uh, with another server taking its place. Or the thing dies, either way. Um, but let's say that the server doesn't die, and we decide to upgrade from MySQL 5.5 to 5.6. Uh, when the ZK entry is removed, the server is now subject to retirement. So we have a three-step retirement process, although there's four in there. Um, we look at ZK uh, to look at all the host names that are in ZK. Uh, our host names have meaning, particularly, well, it works like something like shardDB-24, replica set 24 for shardDB and then some number which is an auto incrementing number of uh, servers that have been created. So but we know all the uh, hostname prefixes that we're responsible for. Cool. And then we can uh, query uh, our CMDB to ask what servers are currently in production. And then we can diff them. We can say show what shard DBs exist uh, that are not in ZK and have existed for more than a week or something like that. And if they exist, they should probably not exist. They're probably just costing money, burning lots, making Greenpeace unhappy. So uh, they should probably go away. So we log in to my SQL instance, if it's up, and we look at it, see if there are any uh, clients connected that we care about. And if there are, we bomb out. If there aren't, we reset some counters in user stats, which is part of uh, the Propona um, builds of my SQL. So we reset to these counters, and then we sleep. We come back a day later. And we check, has anybody used this server? If the answer is yes, 
well, we have a problem. And I'll probably go turn on the general query log and go track down some server that can talk to ZK or something like that. But by and large, the answer is no. Uh, nobody has talked to it. The server is lonely. The server wants to go away. Cool. We shut down MySQL. And then we sleep again. And then, if no one has complained, a day later, we terminate the instance. And that's where my problems end. I don't maintain hardware, and I'm very, very, very happy about this. The server just goes away. Uh, and maybe, maybe next time that I provision the server, it, it will be this uh, uh, instance that I just killed, uh, resurrected. I don't care. One way or another, I enjoy not having this problem. Um, so at this point, uh, when a server dies in the middle of the night, I get a call uh, automatically, and it's usually two commands, the failover and then the launch replacement. We'll shove this into Nagios Handler probably before too, too long, but honestly, I'm awake for like two or three minutes, and I can back, get back to sleep. So it's not too much of a problem, and I'm very, very happy about it. Uh, so in practicing, I realized that I was under on time. I'm at 10.36. So I wanted to throw in two other, a uh, couple other things. Uh, I'm working on open sourcing uh, this code because it's almost entirely not interest specific. Um, however, as I'm sure anybody who's open sourced anything of significant size, it can be a pain in the backside. Um, so no promises, but I'm hoping it can happen because I really, really like taking work from my last job to my next job. Um, it's very handy. And for those of you who interact with AWS uh, and large files, I strongly recommend that you go check out S3 Gopher. Um, we had pretty significant problems with corruption uh, when transferring large files to S3. Uh, and we ended up solving it in a couple of different ways. Uh, but S3 Gopher is very, very fast and really, really awesome. And I, I kind of love it. Uh, and if you went to the Procona conference, you may have uh, caught a presentation by my partner in crime, uh, a guy named, by the name of Kearney, who talked about our, what we discovered with kernels. We made uh, MySQL go five times faster per I.O. by upgrading kernels. Um, so with the work that's been done, uh, well, we're still about at one DBA managing all the MySQL. Uh, my partner in crime splits his time working on HBase, and I split my time working on Redis. And it works out pretty well. And we're hiring, uh, particularly for HBase. Yeah. Anybody have questions? Hi. Uh, Howdy. You mentioned, you mentioned about S3. Uh, yes. And uh, it's passed for the large files. So what size of the files are you talking about? Or the size of the object? And what do we use S3 for? Uh, so S3 is a generic object store. So you throw some bits in there. Um, and there are two modes. Um, and they're differentiated by the size of what you're storing. Above four gigabytes, uh, you have multi-part uploads, which are vastly more problematic than non-multi-part uploads. Um, maybe. Uh, we didn't have problems for a while, and then we did. Um, so uh, you have to really, really aggressively check some in order to catch problems. And the nice thing about XB streams, the MySQL binary uh, backup format, is that it's working off NoDB data, which is internally checksum. If there be a problem, it tells you loudly, and then dies, which can be really, really frustrating. Uh, but it's better than having silent data corruption. Um, so above four gigabytes of data, you probably should need. Uh, I strongly suggest uh, doing work to check on your data integrity. Just simply, you said uh, 5x improvement for upgrading your kernel. Could you just mention a few uh, versions of uh, what you upgraded from to? Uh, so we have been on 3.2. Uh, we went to 3.18, which is pretty bleeding edge. 
three eight would have gotten a bunch of improvement for us. Uh, three thirteen would have gotten much of the rest, and there were a few things that came in in three eighteen that we wanted. Uh, we did an incredible amount of benchmarking, um, big for loops with different file systems, and uh, we ended up with XFS on three eighteen. Um, your mileage may vary if you're on real hardware. This probably does not apply to you nearly as much. Is your database hardware really pretty homogenous? Um, so we live on the cloud, and we uh, can use the fact that it's a cloud to migrate between uh, hardware types, and we do so a lot. Okay. Uh, Does Zookeeper notice anything about your database host when they come up, or are you giving it, is it all, is any of it based on performance or something about the hardware itself? Uh, so sometimes it's based on performance because, you know, SSDs are slightly faster than spinning disk. Just and sometimes it's based on uh, the amount of uh, disk space available. Um, and Zookeeper knows nothing of this. Um, all the configuration that I can get from our cloud provider, I get from our cloud provider. Um, I detect all of it and then I build new servers based on that detection. Uh, Zookeeper is very, very simple. It's a replica set name, key, uh, and then a value which is some JSON, similar to what they're doing, uh, with a master and a slave and a little bit of other data. And that's it. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Rob. All right. Uh, I'd say let's give another round of applause for all the speakers.